All right, so it looks like we are up and running, everybody. Welcome to, uh, let's see, today is Thursday. It is 9-1, September the 1st. Welcome to today's um, camera class. I'm in a little bit of a different setting than normal. Um, had to switch the rooms. Uh, another conference room was being used by some other staff members, but uh, we got our famous apt quote in the background behind me. The answer is always yes to any reasonable request. Um, don't worry about that. Today we're going to be doing camera basics. So in a couple minutes here I'll get started. I was running into some technical issues getting set up in a new spot. Um, but we're going to go through camera basics today. It is the true basic thing for taking a photo. Um, how to graduate from your smartphone and move into something like a mirrorless or a DSLR. Um, we'll be focusing on how to use auto, how to shoot through the photo, and just how to take a clean image. Um, it doesn't look like I have anybody joining me in person today, um, which actually kind of works out since I'm in a much smaller space. Um, but give it another minute or so. I've got about six viewers right now, so we'll give it a little bit, and then we'll get ju we'll jump start. Putting that up so we get ready. Um, but yeah, welcome to Camera Basics, everybody. My name's Saxon. I'm your uh, teacher for the day, and uh, yeah, we'll get jump we'll get uh, started in just a moment. Like always, I tell everybody, um, for anybody who's new to these videos, the way that this will work is I start about right now, we go till about 6.30, and then from 6.30 to 7, it'll be open for uh, any questions or any chats that you might have. Um, for anybody who is here, you're able to, um, or anybody who's online, you're able to just chat and then I'll respond in the middle of the video here. Uh, typically for anybody who would be in person, I would just have them talk, so. Yeah, give it another minute or so. We'll get started. Alright, let's uh, give it a few more minutes there. Let's uh, jump right into it and get going. Um, we do have a lot to cover within the hour. So welcome to Camera Basics. I'm Saxon. I'm your host for the day. Um, so let's just jump right start into it. So when, uh, where to go when all else fails? I talk about this at the beginning of every camera class that I teach and I love this little picture of the, uh, of the I think it's a French Bulldog there. Um, always read your owner's manual before. Uh, I think that goes with anything that you purchase ever. If you're buying a device like a camera, it's important that you're looking at this guy and kind of getting a feel for it before you do anything else. Um, you know, reading the camera guide is super important and in the long run will really benefit and help you as a photographer. Um, uh, also just to understand the button layout and everything else, sometimes there is a question that you might ask other photographers about what you're doing or what you're using. Um, and when you're doing that, they might not necessarily have the answers for you, but the owner's manual most likely will. Um, button layouts, um, where to find certain things, function, what does certain things stand for. On cameras, they're very big on coding things with initials or with letters. Um, so just triple checking your owner's manual to see what all that means is great. YouTube is my personal favorite resource. Anytime I have a question on anything, I first I go on YouTube. Uh, a lot of the times I can read stuff on Google and understand it, but if I've watched somebody who's going through the steps, I can mimic it and I can um, understand it a little bit better. So YouTube is always my first or secondary resource past just reading the owner's manual. Uh, and then I throw a master class on there. Uh, it became very popular during COVID and during the height of the pandemic. A lot of uh, very famous and prolific uh, 
uh, prolific artists and writers and musicians and so on and so forth. They came out with their own masterclass series where they taught people how to do or use certain things. So masterclass is another amazing resource, definitely worth looking into if you've got the time and if, you, if you're looking to find uh, outside resources other than just YouTube or your owner's manual. Uh, getting into it, now, when we talk about taking a photo, way back in the day, you would put film into a camera, and that film would then record the image onto a um, onto film. And basically from there, you would d develop the film, and then you could print images through an enlarger, and or send in your film and have somebody else print it. But nowadays, everything's digital, and the ease that people have nowadays from needing to load film in and being careful of light sensitivity and exposing their film to nowadays being able to put a microchip into your camera and have that save all your images. Uh, in the same respect, though, like you would when you would get film, you would look at the ISO and the grain level of the film. Um, in a very similar way, you're looking at the level of the different uh, SD cards and the storage and the speed and the read and write that they all have. So, first thing I always say, it's important to have at least two SD cards. Uh, I like to always live in the world of having a backup in case something fails. While digital technology is more reliable than a lot of the old SLRs and film cameras were, Digital still has its hang-ups and its hookups, and I've had uh, plenty of photographer friends that have gone on shoots before where one SD card will fail. Luckily, they had two, either one already inside the camera because their SD card, or they had a camera that had dual SD card slots. Sometimes they'll just keep one in their back pocket. Um, it's important just in case something goes wrong. You'd hate to be on a shoot or be shooting in general, maybe on a good vacation of yours that you've been waiting to take all year and then no SD cards are saving photos. All of the photos that you were about to take won't be saved and those vacation memories won't be found again. Um, so have two SD cards. Going back into that too, I mean gigabyte size or anything else, it's important that you pick something with a decent gigabyte size. You know, if you're just taking photos, uh, 32 gigabytes might be perfectly fine for you, but I typically like to live in the camp of to have at least 64 gigabytes on an SD card. Have an all right read and write speed. It doesn't have to be the fanciest read and write, especially if you're just getting into this. Um, uh, I would say storage-wise, the 32 or 64 would be a great number, but if you can go higher than that 128 or 256, some even 512s out there, it's a great thing to have in case you ever want to get into video. Or if you're going on a longer trip and let's say you're going to be taking photos the entire weekend, you might not necessarily uh, have the availability to put another SD card into the camera. So only having a 32 or a 64, if, let's say you're going to Alaska, might not be enough. So always lean on the side of caution of having more storage than having less storage and I like to say again have two SD cards at you at once just to be on the safe side. The bitterness of poor quality remains long after the sweetness of a low price is forgotten. Uh, it's really important. I, you know, There's a lot of different things out there within the technology and in the appliance world where Let's say that you have, you know, the cheaper of the two options. It might be more effective for your budget. It might be um, a better price overall, and it might get you through with what you need. With cameras, the more money that you put into the camera, the better this camera will perform and the better photos you will take. Um, there's a lot of technicality with cameras. There's a lot of skill that goes into it. A lot of the stuff that we'll talk about in the intermediate class next week. Um, but it's important to remember that a majority of the beginning of that camera and how you're doing everything comes from the uh, initial money that you put into it. So you can always get a good price and find something out there for cheap that helps you get into the into photography, into taking photos. Um, but remember that. When you look at other artists or you look at other friends who have maybe better photos or uh, clearer photos, um, less pixelation, uh, maybe a really high quality video, um, you can say that it's from their skill and their knowledge as a photographer, as a uh, cinematographer, but reality of it too is that the camera does play a huge part into that. Um, so remember that the more money you put into the camera, the more money that you put into your photography, the better the quality of the images will come out, even if you're truly just a beginner. Uh, and then going back into the memory cards, your picture should not live on your memory card. 
it's important that you take those images off and we'll go through the steps for that but I get a lot of people who will buy 50 SD cards over their lifetime and they'll keep the photos on there and that's one way of a backup solution I do like doing that because I know that it offers a good amount of protection in case let's say a hard drive or your computer or anything else um, dies on you at least you have all the photos on the SD card but it's a little silly when there's so many other storage systems that have more efficiency towards how you can store your photos your videos um, letting things live on your memory card only just kind of increases the risk of something happening where the SD card is lost forever and all the photos that you've taken and done are gone. When we want to make sure that we transfer our photos over to our computer or to another device, it's important that we uh, turn the camera off and that we go through these steps on the bottom. So. Uh, turning your camera off is the first thing, pretty self-explanatory, but I have seen a lot of people who just take their SD card out willy-nilly or pull a lens off their camera without taking, uh, without turning it off. Turn your camera off. Um, in my experience, knock on wood, I've never had it where my SD card has malfunctioned or not saved something properly or, um, you know, anything else unless I maybe mid-photo or something, but you never know and I would hate for you to take the risk of losing all your photos so start by turning off your camera and wait five seconds wait a little bit of time before you remove that SD card just to allow the camera system to power down any other residual photos that might be transferring into the SD card or capturing inside there give it the time so that way it can load into it just for a couple seconds then go ahead and remove your card typically with an SD card it's held in with a spring-loaded um, clip so you push in on the spring it would release and then you're able to remove the SD card um, place it into a card reader now there's a couple different schools of thought with this and we'll talk a little bit about card readers later uh, but with a card reader you have two options you can put a card reader onto the computer some older model computers still also have it built in you can also plug a lot of these newer cameras into the computer and manually take photos off the SD card that way too I'm a big fan of using the reader. I don't have to worry about plugging my camera in. I can keep it over to the side, charge it, keep my desk space clear too as I'm editing photos and playing on the computer. Um, so I like the card reader. From my experience too, I've read a few different articles on it. Um, there's a little bit more safety and security with putting your SD card in SD card into a reader too. Um, the possibility of you not losing any information. Sometimes things can get muddied up when the camera's plugged in via its multi-port. Um, overall, it's another nice accessory to have. If you are on any computer anywhere in the world, you can plug this guy in, plug the SD card in from there. You don't need any extra cables with your camera or what have you just an easy way to get your photos off and going under there don't use your camera to read the card or send photos um, this is kinda going off the idea with the card reader you're able to take the photos off a lot of photographers will express that using the camera to take the photos off or sending the photos via Bluetooth or Wi-Fi can damage the battery hurt the camera overall um, I will admit, if you transfer photos via Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, you're going to eat that battery up like crazy. Um, it is not a easy task to send it over Wi-Fi, but your cameras, if they're newer, I would say within the last couple years, they can absolutely do that, and it's a really nice feature to have. Um, the example I use is if maybe you're out and about, you're shooting with the family, um, you just want to put a couple photos on a social media real quick, nothing crazy. Uh, you can send the photos that you've taken on the camera to your phone and then from there you can actually edit the photos on your phone depending if you have a Samsung or a Apple or just an Android based or an iOS phone. Uh, there's a lot of nice options with that. Card readers, these are the ones that I, we have here in the store. We've got ones from Sony that do CF Express. I've got uh, ProMaster ones that fold a little bit easier, make tra travel much simpler. Uh, but those can also do CF Express. The one on the all the way on the left here, um, this guy right there, it can do CF Express, a micro SD, compact flash as well too. And this guy over here can do a compact, or a um, CF Express and a regular and micro SD. Nice if you have multiple different cameras. Um, my example for this would be that the GoPro uses a micro SD card a um, Sony Mark 7 or uh, Alpha 7 um, Mark 4 will have dual SD card slots 
And then something like the R5 from Canon, uh, that's going to use a compact or a uh, CF Express. So again, different memory cards for different purposes, different camera types, and then on top of that too, card readers can read almost all of those. If not, certain card readers are more selective than others. Um, but having a card reader, you're reducing the chance of having any issues uh, transpond between trying to transfer from the camera into the computer. You're just taking out the cord or taking out the in-between from there and taking the SD card right to the device that you're trying to transfer all the images to. Going back into the uh, information about the uh, SD cards, copy photos to a destination folder. Now when I say copy them, I mean copy them. Don't move them. If you move them, you're taking them from one location and moving it to the other. By copying it, you're duplicating the image or the item, and then you're moving that copy over to another section as well, too. So what I get a lot of people who do, what they'll do is they will save all their photos onto a folder on their computer. They'll keep that folder on the computer, but then they'll get themselves a tri uh, a, um, a um, hard drive of some sort and then they'll take the photos from there and move it to the hard drive. They will copy them onto the hard drive and they'll have two locations now. So they'll have one section of photos on the computer, safe, they can always access it, then they'll have another set of photos on their hard drive. Also safe, available. Hard drive, you know, the benefit of doing something like that, and we'll talk a little bit more, actually it's right below it too, the external drive, is that if, let's say you spill coffee on the computer, your hard drive will be protected with all of your images, your files, your videos, whereas your computer will now be fried and not have any of that information. So the other options below, Prime Photos, Google Drive, they're all cloud-based solutions. So what I tell people is that when you're taking photos and doing pho photography, it should be at the storage or where you're putting your information should be as important as um, how you're saving it and um, uh, how you're moving items to save it. An external drive, Prime Photos, Google Drive, so either having a external hard drive or having cloud-based solution. And the kind of pros and cons of doing that we'll talk about a little bit, but don't move your photos, copy them. And when you copy them, put them into multiple locations just in case something hits the fan where you've spilled coffee on your computer, you lose a hard drive, you've lost um, an SD card. At least the photos are available on one source and can be found and pulled for later use and they're not all just um, concentrated to one item. After you've done that, eject the card properly. So uh, Apple, it's pretty simple. Grab the uh, memory card on the screen there and drag it down to the trash bin. That'll eject it, and then you can pull the card right out. On the bottom of the right-hand corner of your computer of a um, uh, uh, Windows, you'll be able to click, and then it'll have a drop-down with the SD card there. You can click it again, and then it'll allow you to uh, eject it. It's important to eject it because if you don't eject it from the camera or from the computer after you've done it, there's a possibility of you losing photos, losing information via the transfer if something didn't finish up or continue. And then format the card in the camera. When you put the physical SD card into the camera, it should automatically ask you to format it. Um, it's important that you don't erase everything into the, in the reader. Um, sometimes things can get junked up, cards can become unformatted. I've heard a couple different horror stories from it, but safest bet, after you've properly ejected it and everything else, put it back into the camera, go into the settings of the SD card and make sure it's properly formatted so that way when you're ready to shoot again, your settings are still there and everything that you had before is still there. A little coffee to keep me going. <laughs> um, your backup plan. So it starts with the SD card on the top there. SD card goes into the camera. That's what's going to be your storage. No camera, at least no mirrorless or DSLR that I'm aware of currently being manufactured has any type of internal storage. Camera companies want you to do your own internal storage because there's different means for inter, uh, internal storage depending on what you're doing or taking photos or videos of. You go from the SD card down to the computer. Those are your two main. You'll take the photos on the SD uh, on the camera, which will then be connected to the SD card, and then you'll transfer them into the physical uh, computer. From there, you got your two other options, so your secondary options. 
you have your hard drive and then you've got your cloud-based solution. Hard drive is my personal favorite way to go. You have a tangible object with you, a tangible object you can plug into your computer and then from there you can always access the photos, delete, get rid of, do whatever you want. Downside to doing that is that if let's say something were to happen where you lose, misplace, or put this somewhere or get it wet or damaged, you're not going to be able to access those photos again. So having one or two of those is sometimes necessary. And then the cloud-based solution. As long as you can remember a username and password and you're not annoyed by re-logging in every once in a while, this is a great way for you to take your photos and images, videos, anywhere you want. You could be shooting here in Chicago or shooting in Illinois and then get into a plane, fly out to Rio and be able to still take photos and videos and access all of the old ones that you already did via your cloud solution. And then how to get into it, I mean, there's so many different... Hmm. Coffee is not helping today. Oh, I apologize, everybody. Um, there's so many different cloud-based solutions that you can look at. Adobe Creative Cloud is one of my personal favorites. It allows you to store stuff on there. It also allows you to chat with other artists and other people who have stored stuff, stuff out there. Um, you can pin things to a wall where then others can see and actually comment on your work and view. Uh, but what's really nice about it too is not only do you get the creative you not only do you get a cloud-based uh, solution for storage, but you get all of all the uh, and other Adobe perks. So Photoshop, InDesign, Lightroom, um, stuff that cinematographers and photographers love to use because it benefits and keeps their their work. Um, relevant but also as finely detailed as possible. Google Photos OneDrive, One, uh, OneDrive being, Windows, uh, being uh, Microsoft's work, Google obviously, Google Drive being Google's. Uh, both are great solutions, both are great ways to store your images and your videos and everything else so that way you're able to access later on and do whatever, ha whatever have you. So let's get into a tour of your camera. This is probably the most in-depth for the camera that we get. We really talk about all the little buttons on there and all the knobs and you get an idea of where things are located. Ooh. I will warn you, it is a Nikon mirrorless, or DSLR I should say. So the buttons and the layout might be a little bit different than what you're normally used to. But the main gist is that all cameras have very similar button functions and, and uh, layouts. So we start with the video start and stop button on the top there. A real quick button on there. It should be a red dot. You click that and that's going to start and stop the video once you've turned the camera on. Below that is the power switch. That's what's going to turn it on and off. Typically, it's by the shutter release button somewhere. You'll see an on and off switch. The idea is that when you're holding the camera in your hands, the on and off switch, if we were to turn the camera over like this, is positioned where you can hit it with your right index, same way that you would take the photo. Makes it really easy, simple to use. Um, underneath that, we then have the exposure comp. When you click on the exposure comp, you're going to get a bar that basically opens up on the bottom of your menu system with a line that goes through it and dashes along the way. In the direct center is the exact spot of the camera where its light is perfectly metered. It is dead center meaning it is not overly saturated and is not undersaturated. It kind of just falls right in the middle. Um, that's a really great tool for when you're taking photos to make sure that you're getting a clean easy shot that doesn't necessarily um, have too much going in one direction or the other via its saturation, its light, its color. Uh, if you have something that's overly saturated, you'll get everything to kind of white out and look too bright, and if you are undersaturated, you're going to get a dark image. It's going to feel like someone didn't turn the lights on. Live view switch. Um, so with the live view switch, that's a it's a knob dial underneath the actual... Um, mode dial or the command or the, yeah, the mode dial but on this case the live view switch is going to be uh, a little toggle that switches between you doing your LCD screen and your viewfinder 
why might you want to switch really depends on you, the person who's filming or taking photos. Some people exclusively only work through the viewfinder, others only like using the LCD screen. Some people like to hybrid it and do a cross between the two. It really comes down to your personal preference. If I'm taking a photo, I'm going to use a viewfinder. If I'm doing a video of any kind, I'll use the LCD screen so that way I can keep the, bot the camera away from me so I can make some more modular movements while I'm shooting. Um, and then I skipped one, but the mode dial, the one above it. So where the live view switch is, it's a little switch underneath the mode dial. The mode dial lets you switch between the different modes that are on the camera. Typically green, A, or auto is going to be your most simple, basic, easy to use camera uh, mode. And the reason I say that is because you don't have to do any of the work that a normal photographer would have to do if you were to use any of the other settings. You set up the camera to auto, you point it, and the camera will in fact then do the rest of the work for you, so all you need to do is look at the picture afterwards and make sure you liked it. Now, within doing that, you sacrifice the artistic liberty and the choice that you have to oversaturate, undersaturate, and play with um, color, and how light affects the subject matter. But for a lot of people out there, auto is exactly what they need to get the job done. Anything else would just be overkill. And we'll talk more about the overkill, the aperture, and then the shutter speed priorities next week. Um, but it's important to remember that that is the next step from your basic beginner class, or your basic beginner of learning how to just do and play with automatic. Underneath the mode dial and live switch is the command dial. So when you're on your physical camera, and I can pull mine out for example in a little bit here, the camera itself will have a dial that allows you to uh, set a certain command on there. Now when you're doing, let's say, full manual, you can use this command dial to switch between your ISO, your shutter speed, your um, exposure. You can set all of these things on there, and what's nice about that is um, you're able to play with how light and how subject and foreground and background affect whatever you're taking a photo of. So command dial is super important when you're using stuff that are not in auto. Going from the side, we have our flash button. So the flash button is pretty self-explanatory. You click that, it'll kick up the flash on the camera if you have one available. DSLRs for the most part all will because of how Poorly, I would say they perform in low light. Uh, mirrorless cameras, for the most part, you won't see them. They usually sell them as an ex um, an extra accessory. Cool part about having a flash, you know, if you're in an area that's super dark, you can set a lot of different things on the flash, whether that's strobe, whether that is a pulsating light. You got a couple different options that you can go ahead and do depending on what amount of money you put into a light. If you're a starting photographer, do I believe a light is necessary for you? No. I think that as a beginning photographer, it's important to learn your, um, your capabilities and your limits during the daytime, where then you have the ability to really go through and look at what you took. Um, you don't have to worry about lighting. You can just focus on taking a clean photo and getting that photo. Function button underneath. The function button is going to be uh, labeled an FN, and usually it gives you a multitude of different things depending, but a lot of the time it's to set a certain function or uh, feature on the camera. So, for example, you might set I had one, one of my old Fujifilm cameras, where I had set it so that way I was able to get into the biometrics of the video. So I was able to click my function button and it would take me into the video part where I could film, but it would break down everything with all of the grids. So it would give me my RGB color line grid, my values, and then my um, saturation level, which I thought was awesome, especially being a photographer and shooting the way that I do. I, and I got a lot of benefit out of that. Zoom ring and focus ring, they're both pretty self-explanatory. Your zoom ring is going to be the ring that you rotate to change the focal length. The higher the number, the more tight the image will be. And the lower the number, the wider the image will be. So you have a difference between wide angle and um, 
a tighter portrait or zoom lens angle, and we can talk a little bit more about those, but those two rings will control the zoom of it. And then focus, when you look through a lens, that blurriness that you can see for the other person, the fact that you have to squint when you look at stuff, that is where focus comes into play. So focus will play on the image or on the subject at hand and make sure that it is completely in focus um, or not in focus, depending on what you, the photographer, wants to do. You have the option to play with both. Drive mode button is going to be the way that you're taking photos. So the drive mode on here basically allows you to do a burst act, a burst action, continuous shot, um, one image. You have the availability to choose a multitude of different um, image capturing methods and then select it for that camera. Going to the back, we now have our menu button. The menu button is going to take you through things like the white balance on the camera, your um, exposure, your um, save settings. Basically, anything that's not associated with the shutter speed, the ISO, and the f-stop are all going to be within the menu button. So it's important to learn your menu button, learn where things exist in the menu button. This way you can change and kind of go about it a little bit differently. Diapeter. I understand diapeter. This is where I always get a little confused in explaining it. But the best way I think about this is when you look through a pair of binoculars. A lot of the times when you put them up to your eyes, it's blurry. It doesn't feel right. So what, what do you do? You sit there in the center of the binocular and you twist the diapeter. And it works with your eyes to give you the correct plus and minus. So that way, when you're looking through the, the viewfinder, you are seeing a clear image on the other side. Regardless of whether you focus the camera or not, um, the diapeter will allow you to get the cleanest image or cleanest view through the viewfinder on there for your eye. And it's rotatable, so depending on who's looking through it, you can change it, lower it, or raise it. The info button, after you take a photo, uh, let's say you're shooting on auto, one of the things I tell my students all the time when they're first getting into taking photos, use the info button. When you click the info button, it will actually allow you to see the information from the photo. So if you shoot on auto and you click the info button, you should then get a breakdown of what the camera then dictated was going to become the best image. It'll say it used this ISO with this shutter speed, with this f-stop. Um, and it gives you all of that information. So what I like to say is start shooting on auto, use that info button to figure out what your camera did for you, and then once you can figure that out, you can kind of get an idea of, oh, it worked really well in this situation versus this situation, and it worked really well in this situation, but it didn't look good in this situation. Well, now you know what photos to take, how to take those photos, and then what settings to use. Uh, focus and exposure lock, when you are taking pictures and you click on the focus or exposure lock, it also turns into like another menu service of some kind. Um, depending on the camera that you have, it will actually lock on the certain exposure, not allowing for the meter to continue going up or down. Sometimes it will also lock in on the focus item that you have. Um, so whatever is in the crosshairs of your focus, whether that is a more you know tight singular box, a wider box, or you're doing landscape, and you have multiple signal points all over your screen, your focus lock will help and initiate all that too. It also allows for what you see on the menu to pop up and disappear when you're looking at the LCD screen. Should be the same for the viewfinder too. It depends sometimes on the camera brands. But for the most part, if you're using the focus, or if you click the focus and exposure lock, it'll affect both the LCD and the viewfinder. The I button on the bottom also gives you more information on the photos that you've taken, but it also can access a bunch of different um, uh, screens or menus. Again, depends on the camera brand that you're using as a whole. My I button will take me into my white balance uh, coordination so I can actually choose what my white balance will be, what my graininess will be, and a few other features. The OK button, pretty self-explanatory if you're guiding the uh, navigate or the menu system on here and you're going through the settings in the menu. If you click OK, that should get you either back to the previous page you were on or save whatever you were doing and move forward. 
Then you've got your uh, the dial that goes on the multi selector. Again, depends on the physical camera. Uh, a lot of the Sony cameras and Nikon cameras, it's a rotatable dial like the old iPods used to be, and so you can actually sit there and zoom in on a photo, zoom out of a photo, skip photos with it, go back on photos. But you can also use that dial to um, you know, enlarge a photo or go through your settings in your menu. Underneath that, we have our minus and plus magnifying glass, pretty self-explanatory. You want to look at the picture to see if you can catch how pixelated it gets at a certain point to see how big you can blow it up. Maybe you know, you're looking at something you're like, what is that all the way in the back corner there? That's where you'd zoom in or you'd use your magnifier button. And then there's the delete button. Pretty self-explanatory. It's a trash can. Click on it. It'll delete whatever the image, video, whatever it is that you got saved on there. So the mode dial, all brands do it a little bit differently. It's important to note that. When we look at Nikon, we look at Sony, we look at Canon, the big three, all three of their modes look different, but they're all basically the same. With any given mode dial, you're going to have a couple different main exposure parts on there. So the mode dial going into it, A for auto, or A plus for auto, um, auto control settings and functions on the camera. Everything that you want to take a photo with, this is the simplest one. You set it to auto, you point the camera, you shoot. Done. Good to go. Full manual, so M, is the opposite side of that. It means you control every little detail, every small nuance. It's it's up to you, the photographer. And this is the traditional way that it's done. Um, let's say that you are in a nice room with good lighting and you don't really need to have a, a high ISO. As a photographer, you have the ability to keep an ISO low or raise the ISO to make it higher to affect the picture and what actually goes on. You can call it a level of distortion. Um, you can also just call it, it's, it's your personal choice, it's your preference as a photographer. A or AV is aperture priority. So we get more into it in the next couple weeks, but aperture priority, shutter priority, and manual are the, three, are the big three of the dial, other than auto. Um, full manual, you control every little bit. Aperture priority, you only control the aperture or the f-stop of the camera. Now, the best way to think about the aperture or the f-stop is to think of a little pinhole. Um, if you um, if you go out in the sun and you stare at the sun for a prolonged period of time, your eyes will start to dilate and it'll give you a tiny little black dot where your eye is. When you then come inside and you stare in the mirror and you look at yourself there, you'll notice how your pupil just expands and it goes huge. That is the same exact way that the iris works on a camera, except instead of you pointing at the sun and it getting bigger or larger, it is you controlling it as a photographer to make it bigger or wider. And uh, long story short, the aperture really gives a good relationship between background and foreground, stuff that we'll talk about next week within class. but. Again, that's something that you'll see on these cameras. And shutter priority, which I mentioned a minute ago, is how fast the camera closes. So you have the metal uh, iris that is then dictating how much light and what the relationship between foreground and background is. But now shutter speed is going to control how fast those shutters are closing to get an image. Again, it depends on what you're taking photos of. But if you were, let's say, a bird watcher, and you saw a beautiful gaggle of geese fly across the sky. You wouldn't sit there and try to take a photo real slow. You would take a photo real fast. Um, and you'd want to set your camera to take the photo real fast because on the off chance that they go so fast that you miss them, having a slow, more slow down camera will lead to a um, better frame and you capturing a better image. So shutter speed is also prior, uh, also important too, depending on what you're looking to do. Program, 
means that everything's on auto, but uh, or it means sh aperture and shutter on auto, but everything else is changeable. So you can go through and change any of the settings in the program. Um, it allows for you to organize, control, and set whatever you'd like on there, so that way you're able to come back and always use the same thing. B bulb. Some cameras don't even have this anymore. I grew up at a time where they did, but it's it's where the shutter release will stay open consistently without you having to do anything other than click the button. Again, my best example is during the 4th of July. You see these really cool pictures of all the fireworks looking like they were shot off at the exact same time. They've left trails and smoke and everything in the air. Or you get those cool photos of people overlooking the expressways and you see car lights zooming by and there's hundreds of lights. Those are all done with long exposure, the bulb setting. And all this means is that it's fully customizable, but you get to keep that aperture open for as long as you want. I love it, especially when I'm trying to get fun, cool, creative shots that just add a little bit of flair. Maybe I'm tired of just taking a standard photo. This is a great way to get creative with something that you already have. But when almost fails, and I cannot, cannot stress this enough, stay on auto. As a beginning photographer, nothing upsets my students or my everybody more than when you're just getting into it, you get a little over ahead of yourself, you learn about the exposure, you learn about lighting, you learn about shutter speed, you go to throw this into practice and you take a terrible photo. Nothing comes out clear, blurry, too dark, too grainy, too everything. Starting on auto, Use that info button I told you about, and any photo that you take, you'll automatically be able to see all the information about it and gauge you know, what you're supposed to do in certain situations. That's the best way to start. Start with auto, then graduate from there. The idea of this class is that you are graduating from that smartphone that you keep in your pocket, and you want to use a better camera because you want to take a better photo or a better video. Road to get there. It's not hard, but it starts with auto. Now, with auto, there's no one more mode called scenes. Now, if I'm not mistaken, this should be a Canon camera that we're seeing right here. Scenes was a fancy way for Canon for basically saying, here is auto, but these all are very specific features on there. So. For example, we'll see auto. Underneath it, we'll see like a little lightning bolt with an arrow going through it. And that basically just means that the flash is turned off, but it's still auto. Going down from there, you're going to see things like a head and mountains and a flower and then this kind of goofy looking running person. All different settings that are geared towards taking photos with priority in the automatic side, but in a priority with something. So. You know, that one of the head is a portrait. The priority for that one is that if you hold the, this camera to somebody and you just try to take a headshot or you try to take like a nice photo of me standing like this, you're going to get a clean image doing that. If you're taking a picture of mountains or something in the distance, you might want to use that mountain one because it's better for ranged photography, for wide angle, for that kind of thing. Speed, uh, or the guy running, speed. So if you got cross-country track star um, kid of yours and you want to get good pictures or videos of them you might want to use this so that way you get them in the motion of running and you don't just get all the blurriness of their arms and legs flying everywhere and then the flowers of macro photography nice part about that is if you see a beautiful flower in your garden you're like oh it's the end of summer I want a clean image you point that camera at it and you get a clean image of the flower nice and zoomed in and everything else now this was on the old DSLR lineup from Canon. I know that you would see this across their Rebel series. Um, I don't know if their M50 had it. Uh, it's been a long time. I'm, I'm so stuck on mirrorless now that I don't really remember these dials as much. But typically if I see these dials on someone's camera, I usually know it's a sign that it's probably time to upgrade their camera too because of the age and whatnot. Most cameras, especially Nikon or Canon nowadays, you will not see these dials. You will see a mixture of what I showed you earlier 
which is more of all of these dials where it's just your regular letters on there, your uh, manual, your aperture, your shutter priority, your programmable, and then your auto, intelligent auto. Um, this is more of an old school dial, but it still exists, and if you love your camera and you do not want to upgrade and buy something new or change what you've been doing, um, it's important to know that those are all available to you, and especially as a beginning photographer, worth using, worth learning about. My camera doesn't work. I get this at work all the time, uh, and I find it kind of comical. Uh, I, I try not to laugh at anybody who shows me photos like this, but I get people who come in who will show me the photo, and they're they're very disgruntled and upset. They're like, I don't understand it. I put $2,000 into this camera. I put $500 into this camera. Why do my pictures look like this? Well, you're not using the camera properly, and that, that's as simple as it is. Honestly, it could be how you're taking the photos in uh, non-auto. You might not be, as a beginning photographer, using auto. Maybe you're using your aperture or your shutter priority or your manual, and this is what every picture just looks like. Um, you think you're using all of the uh, exposure triangle rules properly, but again, we, uh, we as humans make mistakes, and when it's our first time doing something, we're not the best at it. Uh, this is a great example of it. Your camera works. It is not the device. It's you. It's user error. So again, stick with auto until then you get your bait. Or you get your footing with it, and then explore, have fun with it. Um, but this is a great example of someone who um, probably did a shutter speed too fast. Um, the ISO is a little bit uh, high too. It's a little grainy. Um, there's a few factors that make this photo eh, less than appealing. Uh, going into that whole thing, your camera isn't a smartphone. Don't expect it to be. We've come from a society of instant gratification nowadays where when we point our phone towards something and we take a picture, it takes a really clean, good image. Um, have you ever tried to zoom in on that photo? Uh, or zooming in with that camera and you see how pixelated things get? It just doesn't get the zoom. Or You take a picture of uh, you know my lovely uh, cup here. You... You know, you'd get good detail, but as you get a little closer to it, it pixelates. The idea of a camera is that it captures more information than what your phone can get. You know, a good iPhone, a good Samsung phone, um, you're looking at anywhere between a 12 to 16, 18 megapixel sensor. Um, some of the Samsung phones boast that they have a 30 to 40 megapixel sensor on one of their cameras, and typically it's their front-facing camera, it's not even a rear. Um, or the rear has a 46 megapixel camera, but it's only for the portrait. So the portrait is what, 50 millimeter lens? 35 millimeter lens, it's not necessarily going to be the quality that you're getting with a physical camera. Now, for the everyday photographer, when I grew up in the 90s, we had disposable cameras with us all the time. They took a nice photo when you'd go to the zoo or go to the park with friends or family. It was awesome. That's what your phone is giving you. It's giving you that instant gratification that something like that camera did. You're watching a football game and you are, you know, you're reading an article online and you see a beautiful picture of a linebacker tackling somebody or a guy jumping in the end zone with the ball in his hand. That's not done on a smartphone. That's done on a real camera. So it's important to remember that your camera's not a smartphone. It's not as quick or as fast as what your phone will do, but that camera is going to take a very impressive, clean, and a precise image as opposed to your physical phone. In the intermediate class, I talked about the difference between a snapshot and a actual pho photograph. Um, I mean, basis of it really all is how you're using the phone and how you use a camera, two very different things. It's a very deliberate action to use the camera, whereas using your phone, it's very quick. So, your phone isn't your camera. Seems like a simple question or a simple thing, but I feel like this is an another important part of camera basics or camera 101 is how you're holding your camera. A lot of um, photographers have back. I mean, anybody who sits at a computer all day or does stuff, you're going to notice that your neck kind of hurts. You start to get a little bit of a hunch. Um, same thing kind of happens with cameras. When you're shooting with your camera, it's important to remember posture. And being able to sit up straight, hold your camera in front of you and keep a good point, it's an important part of it. 
if you arch into when you're shooting or you're you know standing back like this all you're doing is putting strain on your shoulders and your back which make it much harder to take a photo um, and just make it more uncomfy so you know when we look at the pictures here having your arms out like this is not a good way of doing it number one you're keeping your arms too far away from your body making you much more shaky as you're holding the device um, these cameras aren't light if you're doing a point and shoot model you're coming from your phone you're looking at a few ounces if you're doing a full DSLR or a full mirrorless camera with a 400 to 600 millimeter lens on there you're looking at an easy 11 to 10 maybe even 12 pounds it is important that you are using your arms below to kind of act as supports. I, I always think of like a bridge. You know, if I if I were a bridge right here, I've got arches that are coming up or a way of support that's coming up to my bridge to then give support. If I'm holding the camera, I'm able to take my arms and tuck them into my sides and then hold the camera in front of me and take a clean image. It's important to remember that when you're taking a photo, it's a full body image or a full body process. This isn't just you using your hands. Again, it's not a smartphone. It's a camera. It's got weight to it. It's got sensors. It's got components. Second part of that too, going into the bottom area is how she's holding it. Um, you rarely want to hold your camera in an awkward position. Remember, there's two main aspects to holding a camera. There is the action that you're doing on the physical lens. So if you are using full manual and you are a stickler about that, you are using the focus ring and you're using the actual um, size ring. Both in very two important aspects to when you're shooting. And when you're actually taking the photo, you are using the shutter release, which is on one side, and you're using your command dials and mode dials. So when you're shooting, arms are down here and your hands are kept comfortably on the lens or on the bottom of the body and then on the physical side of the body so you're kind of gripping in this kind of double-handed format now again depending on where we have it it kind of looks like you're holding a pistol of some sort that's the way that you want to think about this when you're doing it is that you're holding you're holding a pistol in a way um, but shooting through it and holding it it's all important. Um, it helps take a clean image, but then it also helps build stabilization within your hands. And that's the biggest thing you want. The shakier you get when you're taking a video or a photo, um, the more that it then shows or transfers over in the final result. Um, within pixelation, graininess, and video. When I first was getting ready to start these classes, the two things I was told is that you have two options when you're taking a video. You can either have okay or bad audio or okay or bad video you can't have both if you're using the built-in mic on your camera odds are your audio it's gonna sound a little tinny a little boxy depending on the model that you get so it really comes down to how clean and how crisp that image is so the less you can shake the more accessories you can get as far as tripods gimbals any stabilizer it's great most of the cameras nowadays, especially mirrorless, they're shooting in 4K, they're shooting in full HD video, um, and they have great built-in stabilization. But using your arms as a prop to securely put the camera on your body and hold forward, it'll save you 9 times out of 10, and you'll get a much better, cleaner video. So posture, hand positioning, holding your camera is as important as having a modern camera, as important as learning the dials on the camera, it's one of the most important parts of photography is all posture and your body. Focus and then shoot through the picture. I get a lot of people that, again, when you have the phone, it's a quick snapshot. It's quick, 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 done, done. The phone does all the work for you. When you're shooting on auto, the camera will focus for you, but it doesn't focus immediately. You need to do a half click on the camera. That brings your focus parameter in. It helps the lens then, the motor and everything, move and focus in on what you're taking a picture of. Focus. Get your image in focus where everything's clear, detailed in front of you, and then shoot directly through the picture. When I take a picture of something, I look at the item, and then I try to look through the item. And I know that sounds foolish or sounds... Jedi or sensei-like of me, but if you shoot through what you're taking a picture of, you're doing your 
your darndest, I should say, to, number one, get whatever the subject is into frame, focused, and then you're trying to kind of just capture it right in front of you as you're going. Um, you know, there's a lot of different artistic routes you can take to when you're shooting photos to get a really cool, exciting image. Um, but uh, the way I look at it is the same way Michael Jordan looked at shooting a free throw. Uh, story goes, when he would shoot a free throw, he wouldn't look at the front of the rim, he wouldn't look at the backboard, he would look through the net at the back of the rim right there, and he would just try to lay it up and over. When you're shooting a photo, you're looking at your subject, you're focusing it up, and you're trying to shoot through this uh, subject, shoot through the photo, to basically take a still of whatever it is that you're looking at. Uh, best analogy I can give towards that. But focus, then shoot, and shoot right through the picture. And after you're done, take a few more photos. That's another important thing that a lot of photographers learn as they're going, especially when you're on auto. You really don't have anything to lose. The camera's doing all the work for you. But it never hurts to take more than one picture of anything. You never know when something moved and got blurry, something didn't look good. And if you sit there after you take every single photo, hit the playback button and look through, you're just wasting your time. Um, and you're not really going to get all the shots in that you want, especially on cer certain time-sensitive or, um, I would say, time-sensitive photos. If your camera or you are moving, your photos are going to be blurry. Pretty, it's pretty self-explanatory, but just like I talked about within stabilizing yourself with there, having your camera in front of you and taking a good photo, it's important that you're stabilizing yourself and keeping yourself as still as possible. If you're someone who's very shaky, you've got a bad grip on this, tripods, monopods are really popular. Um, anything that uh, is like a gimbal, a stabilizer, you'll benefit from using something like that. Um, gimbals are more for videos and for cinematography, so if you're not doing a lot of that, tripods are your best friend. And if you're someone who's traveling constantly, you know, Saxon, I don't want to carry something around with me when I go to places. Um, I don't want to bring anything heavy either uh, if I have to carry stuff. Monopods are super light, and anything that's carbon fiber, you pay a pretty penny for it. A lot of the times it's a hundred to two hundred dollars more than your standard aluminum tripod but the carbon fiber tripods will make it easier for you to carry and transport these items especially on longer trips things like a safari or a backpacking trip I get a lot of people who complain a lot to me about having to carry heavy packs full of gear a lot of people will buy a point-and-shoot camera so that they avoid having to take multiple lenses or kits with them. Um, and same thing, people will bring a monopod with them. Sometimes the monopod can fork out and give them a tripod-esque legs. But a lot of the times it's just so they can put something on the ground, take a clean photo without having the shakiness of their hands. I'm also a big fan of the camera strap, and I should mention that too. When that camera strap lines up around your neck and you point the camera forward, you have the ability to pull on that camera strap. And I don't think a lot of people think about that, but your neck, your head, and your shoulders are pretty firm, steady, they're pretty firm, steady objects. So if you pull on that strap, not only are you locking your arms forward, giving yourself that support, you're using that strap as a support too as you're taking a photo to shoot through the item or shoot through the thing. Basics for taking a great photo. We'll make this real quick. I've gone a little over time. Should open up for questions soon. But please, if you guys do have questions, mention something in the chat. we got a lot of viewers today. I want to thank everybody for jumping on. But please, pound in uh, some questions in the chat, and I'll answer them as soon as we get through this. But super basic things that you can remember when taking a great photo, or to, ta to remember to take a great photo. First thing is fill the frame. We look at the image on the left and we compare it to the image on the right. There's some dramaticism, there's mood in the one on the left, but if we're being honest, it's a black and white image of, of just one girl. It's kind of a boring photo. Um, in something like this, if we fill the frame up, we're creating less uh, dead space, less negative space. And when I say dead or negative space, anything that the subject of the photo is, is our positive space. It's our full, it's our main subject. Anything that isn't of her or isn't of what we're trying to take a picture is negative or dead space. So for instance, the negative dead space is the wall around her. It is the room that she's sitting in. We don't need that. It doesn't do any good. For the headshot, if we zoom in and we also flip our frame a little bit, now we have her in full focus. She's our main focal point. 
uh, we don't have as much dead space, a little more interesting of an image. Now, again, this plays on two different sides. You can go by the school of thought and fill the frame every time, but maybe something that without filling the frame is more interesting. It's all about reading your subject and reading the room a little bit. Eyes in the top third of the photo. If I am standing up here and you see my eyes, it's a little bit more easy to be attracted to the eyes if they're in the top third of the photo. So this would probably where my head is at right now is the top third. If we drop my head down a little bit, we're in the middle third. And if we go all the way down, we're in the lower third. So we split the image into three quadrants, or the, the frame into three quadrants. Keeping his eyes a little bit higher up, it just makes it easier as far as our view to go through. It's a little bit more of an interesting photo. Um, again, humans were attracted to bright colors, were attracted to placement. Um, there's a rule of thirds that we'll talk about in a little bit here. And then the, the third, you know, top third right now, this, this fits within that rule of thirds if we split it the opposite direction. But keeping eyes, keeping things that we as humans bring into focus, if you keep them within the top third of the photo, uh, naturally as a human we'll be drawn to look at the top of the photo and then kind of build our way down to feel the, or to see the other information. Focus in on the eyes easy trick. Most cameras nowadays, especially Nikon, Canon, and Sony, they have great eye detection. They really take away red eye. Um, Canon and Nikon, too, have really cornered the market on animal detection, too, with their eyes. So not just human eye detection, but actual animals, too. I've got a lot of people that have fur babies and have different animals they just love and adore, and they love taking photos of them. Um, if you're struggling to take a clean photo and you're looking for something that'll help a little bit, focus in on the eyes of the subject matter of whatever you're taking. The camera will do a really good job of making sure that the eyes are in full focus and that then brings the head into full focus. Even if something's a smidge blurry, um, like if we look at the photo here, her hair is a little bit of out of focus, but her eyes are so in focus that you could really care less about her hair. Adds a little bit of more mood to and, and dramaticism to the actual image. Get on their level. Uh, I use this image to start with that because when I look at the photo for this one, I think it's fun, I think it's quirky. I think this is a snapshot, not an actual photo. When then we move to this image, same idea, we're at a birthday party, but now we've gotten down on the same level as the kids. And with kids, I feel like this is a really important one to do with. There's a power dynamic when you have somebody that's really short and somebody that's really tall. And when you're looking down on something, you kind of create this power dynamic that doesn't really feel like an intentional photograph. Again, it feels like a snapshot. It feels like, oh, look at what I'm at right now. Versus, here's this beautiful memory or image that I want to keep forever or something that I want to use to reflect on later, or, you know, whatever you're taking photos of. Get down on the level of the subject matter that you're taking. And the photos just have less of this power dynamic, less of this kind of head game that we have to play as a viewer of the photograph. Um, we can just see a clean image now of these kids cheesing, having a good time at a birthday party. I'm sure that the, the boy smiling in the front there is the birthday boy. And then you got the girl in the background, probably his sister who's smiling at something silly or whatnot. But the image looks more thoughtful, intentional, less of a snapshot, more of a photograph. Or go lower. Uh, again, you create power dynamic, and when you can create something where someone is looking down upon you through the photograph, and you're giving the power to the physical photograph, and I know that might sound silly to think about, um, but think about just you talking to somebody else who stands taller than you are, or if they're standing on a stool or a ladder and talking down to you. This effect of us looking up and them looking down, it creates a certain dynamic. Um, so if you can give that dynamic or that power to the photograph by having them positioned upwards and you down as a photographer, you're opening up the realm of a better photo, you're giving more information, um, you're just creating a cleaner image that will take a beginning photographer's work to a much higher level just with that small little thing. Now let's talk about the rule of thirds. So I broke down the rule about keeping the eyes in the top third uh, a couple slides ago where I showed first level, second level, third level. And this little uh, square box setup kind of shows that off. There's also the thirds of when you split it going this direction. So there's the one, there's the two, and then there's the three. Um, 
in between all of that, we have cross, um, we have intersecting lines. We have our T's. Now, if we put a subject of any kind in those crosshairs, we will have a much more pleasing picture to the eye. And I've got examples to explain that. Next over, I've got my surfer dude. And my surfer dude is standing in the right section of my rule of thirds, and he's standing directly on that line. There's another rule that we haven't talked about, about keeping the sun behind you. We'll talk about that in a later slide, but he's also doing this too. We have what I call my horizon line. That is where the sky and the ground meet. Some photos you'll have it, some photos you won't. If you have a horizon line and you can incorporate it, great. It adds another layer of depth to the photo, which then helps the eyes travel a little bit and creates a um, really fun sense of movement for our uh, viewers of our f f photographs or even for yourself to look on them years later. The horizon line matches perfectly with the top third. Our surfer is sitting on that one line and his shadow also breaks down. The sun is behind him, which gives a really cool shadow, but then the harsh light of that sunset coming down is mitigated because it's behind our guy, it's behind our subject, rather than above or to the side where it blurs things out, it makes too much white space on there. Um, again. It's a very artistically and well thought out photo. Love the sunset photos. We got another one, our beach photos. We got another one here. Black and white, but same idea. Our little girl is on the left side of this. So now she fits on the left side of the quadrant. The sun is behind her or in front of her, if you will, and then it's coming this way towards us. It's a black and white photo, so we're, we don't have too much information that we're reading off of it as far as color and anything else thought of or thought of um, mm -hmm. there. Uh, but given the ominous of the photo, given the horizon line on there, the sun positioning, and then how the girl fits perfectly on that one line, um, we have a clean photo. It's a good photo. Now we go into double rules of thirds. So here we have two families next to each other. We have these brick buildings that are receding into the background, so they're creating depth for the photo. And then on top of that, too, we have... This is where I always kind of make fun of this photo a little bit. We have the, the son and the daughter presumably in the front, in the foreground of the photo. And they're perfect on the rule of thirds. Uh, she stands on one side of him, he stands on the other. The line is directly in the middle of the two, and it breaks the plane perfectly. When we move over to them, if the pho photographer could have just moved the husband and the wife over just a smidge more, they would have been almost identical. But keeping on that rule of thirds, she is directly on that line. And given the spatial relationship between the two and how they're dividing up the image nicely, they're framing the image, uh, the families are, the walls receding are framing the image. There's a bunch of stuff going on here, but this would be an awesome photo to have in the house if you know you were looking to do a picture of the family uh, on vacation and then frame this or send a Christmas card out or what have you. This would be a great example of uh, a clean image that you could use for that sort of thing, and this is a good way of framing it if you're trying to do it yourself. Good old-fashioned Jim Helper from the office here. Uh, this is a great example of using the rule of thirds and killing dead space that's on the photo. So Jim is basically on the third quadrant or in between the middle and the third quadrant on the right side of the image. The entire left side is just a tree, it's dead space, nobody cares. But because we positioned him slightly off camera, makes uh, or slightly off the center of the frame, makes it more interesting. The other option they could have gone with is filling the frame with him, which I know in the office they do that constantly when they're doing the interview. They don't include the background space. They just do the main face here and just keep the character in, in, in uh, focus. Both are great. I think the benefit to doing something like this where Jim is off to the side is you're creating context for the space in which they're in. It's a negative space. It's dead space. Nobody cares about the tan wall in the office. But you know that he's in the conference room right now having this conversation, doing his half smirk to the camera um, because you can see that background, you can see the shutters, and you see this little palm tree, so you kind of put three and three together. 
Now let's talk about the sun on your back rule. So if we look at the uh, image on the top there, we can see that where the harsh light of the sun is coming in on the photo, it is behind the subject matter or uh, in a certain way where our subject matter isn't um, opened up to the camera. We have darkness around them, beautiful lighting on the sky in the background. If we really wanted to keep that, that might be a good option if we you know, didn't care about him, like our surfer guy from the first image. But we want light to be on this guy. We want to open this up. We want to basically allow for the sun to be on my back or on their back to, in order to light this guy up. So the sun would be positioned behind me in this case, coming inwards, and then it's lighting up the subject. Most likely when the photographer was first taking the bad image, they got in real close. They blocked out any light that was focusing in on this guy, and they caused a dramatic shadow, which just doesn't look good. On the second image, they opened up the subject matter. They had the arm go out a little bit more. The hat was removed from the top of the head, so there's more lighting on the face. Uh, overall, we just have a nicer image. We have something that um, you know has more light coming into it, opens the viewer up to the environment, but then also the subject matter, which is super important in this case, a uh, beautiful, healthy fish. And then the last thing that really helps photographers is using the apps on your phone. And you know, there's a lot about taking and using the phone to take images and whatnot. But something I'm a huge fan of that I don't think gets talked about enough is that when you're using the phone and the camera, the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth features on there are awesome. I talk about it in the beginning of the class, but they will eat the battery up like crazy when used um, consistently. But these apps also have self-timers on there. Sometimes they have exposure meters on there. Um, they're your friends. They're your companion app. They're meant to be an extra tool or resource that you can use to control your camera. And I still think they should be used whether or not they eat the battery life up or whether or not they're not as secure as transferring a photo over via a card reader or computer. Um, Using the self-timer app will let you get images like the one that we see on the left there of the gentleman standing in front of the mountains. If you're the only person on a hike, you're not going to ask the abominable snowman to take a photo of you or a, uh, a mountain man. Um, you're most likely going to set it up on a tripod or on a ledge somewhere, point it at yourself, and then use the phone and everything else to get the picture that you need, the, the remote. They do sell remote shutters out there. Some people get into them. I'm not a big fan of them. I would rather just use my phone. It's already here. I've already got one. I just got to download the app. Apps are free. Um, but it's another tool or resource to use that can really help your photography game, especially when you're brand new to it and you're trying to express and take creative photos in ways that you've never done it before. A self-capturing timer app might be the one that you need. Lastly, let's talk about a couple recommended accessories. Um, you know, as a new photographer, you're probably just getting into it. You don't have a lot of um, you know resources or options. Maybe you're brand new to the whole thing. I'd say the best thing to start off with is get a camera with a kit lens. If you can get an all-in-one lens, something closer to a 24 and 70, where you get something wide to a good portrait. If you can get a two lens kit, something that goes 18 to 70 and then like 100 to 300, that's awesome. That gives you a little bit of everything. Portrait lenses, wide angle lenses are probably my most sought after thing here in the store. A lot of the times you find out you want zoom later on. So if you're brand new, you're just starting, get a camera with a good basic small telephoto lens. 18 to 70 is great, 24 to 70 is great as well too. Um, if you you know have the extra capital and you want to get something more, a two lens kit's awesome. But get yourself a kit, get yourself something to start out. If you buy the body and the lens separately, it's always going to cost more in the long run. But if you're someone who's experienced and you know kind of where you're at as far as lenses and you understand how that lens glass relationship works, ball out, get the most expensive lens, get the better lens out of the quality because you'll have it for the long run. Kit lens is just a kit lens no matter what. Um, your glass is what's going to appreciate over time whereas the body will depreciate. And we'll talk about that on the intermediate class a little bit more but if you're just starting, camera, lens, SD card. Big three that you need. All you need to physically get out there, take photos and then see what you're doing afterwards. You want to get fancy after that, 
get some extra lenses, get your lens cleaning kits, get that external hard drive I was telling you about, various filters, you can get polarizing, you can get a non-polarizing, you can get a, um, a um, neutral density, you can get a UV, there's multitudes of different options that you can get for lens filter, for, uh, yeah, lens filters. Don't get hung up on it. Don't let it be a dictating factor or prevent you from going outside to take photos. I didn't even use a lens filter for probably about five or six years until I discovered what they can do and how they can affect glare and how they affect light. Um, so definitely worth it in the future. Bag is a really nice thing to have. Helps you store your camera, take it with you places, an extra battery. If you do get into the phone stuff and you want to transfer photos from your phone to your camera, that battery is gone lickety split. So having an extra battery that you can carry around with you in a backpack, great option to have. Um, helps set you up for success just in case something happens. Um, yeah, I I can't tell you enough. I think accessories or extra add-ons are important. Do I think they make or break you and make you a better photographer or a less better photographer? Absolutely not. It still comes down to how you use the camera and how you shoot with it. So that really concludes everything that I have. I've included my email and my phone number on here. Uh, I got to be better about doing this um, on my later classes. I always forget. But intermediate class is the second Thursday of the month. So it's going to be next Thursday. That is going to be September 8th for everybody out there. Uh, I'll be teaching hopefully in my regular classroom instead of uh, in this room and uh, hopefully we have some people that show up in person. Remember guys, I do this online and I do this in person at the Apt Electronic Store here in Glenview. Um, it's free. Come on in, bring your camera in, ask me questions, uh, bother me. I want to know what you guys are shooting with. I want to know what kind of questions you have. If it's a camera or a feature on the camera that I'm not familiar with, I'm a real whiz with Google. We'll get to the bottom of it, but I'm pretty tech savvy when it comes to these cameras. Thank you guys for sticking with me for the last hour and 15 minutes. Uh, we got about 15 minutes left before I close this down. So please, in the chats now, say hello, uh, answer me some questions, whatever you got. I'll give it another few minutes for people to respond and ask, but. That's what I got for you guys. Thanks for attending, and uh, I will see everybody on the second Thursday of the month, so on September 8th, and we'll talk about uh, intermediate knowledge, the exposure triangle, the lens, the trinity of lenses, um, some editing software that you might want to look into if you're just getting started, and uh, all that good stuff. So, yeah, I'll keep this open for a little bit longer, and uh, thank you guys. All right. Well, doesn't look like anybody has too many or any questions for me uh, or anything. So, thank you guys for showing up. Thanks for listening. And uh, I always enjoy doing the basic camera class, the the GoPro and um, not just general information, but the GoPro action camera class will most likely change that in the future. 
Uh, I got a little sleepy last week while teaching it. It's a uh, not a lot of people are asking about it, unfortunately. And hey, you know, the GoPro cameras and action cameras, they're pretty self explanatory. You can point and shoot them pretty easily. Um, so I, I'm, I'm looking for recommendations on other things to do for the third, for, for our final camera class of every month. Um, the two things I'm kind of positioning now or talking to people about are possibility for drones and how to fly and operate, you know, drone video stuff. Um, and then the other thing would be cell phone cameras. There are a lot of nuances to using one of these phones cameras and for some people they really don't want to invest in buying another DSLR mirrorless camera when they spend $1,200 on a phone. So um, all different avenues we're looking into the future. So, But I know that the basics and intermediate class is super popular. I think we had about 20 viewers at one point today. So really appreciate you guys for showing up. Thanks for everybody who stuck it through now. Um, guys have any questions please feel free to call or shoot me an email right now